friends, and welcome back. We started talking about the process of faith in the last video. Now, in previous videos, we talked about the fact that the faith that we walk by is not our own faith. We saw that in, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, that Paul said that God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. In context, Romans chapter 10 is talking about salvation. In verse 17, we see that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we can say from Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, which follows Romans chapter 10, that faith comes, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The measure of faith, then, we could say, comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In Galatians chapter 2, in verse 16, Paul tells us that we are justified by the faith of the Son of God. Going back to what he said in Romans chapter 12, that we have the measure of faith. Now, how does that measure of faith come? Romans chapter 10, in verse 17, we see that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In Galatians chapter 2, in verse 20, we've seen in previous videos that Paul said that the, that the life that we now live, we live by the faith of the Son of God. So we talk about walking by faith. When we talk about walking by faith and not walking by sight, we're talking about walking by the faith of the Son of God. This is not our faith. Our faith is a natural faith based on natural input of our five physical senses. We receive a doctor's report. We can choose to have faith in what the doctor is telling us, or we can choose to look at a, a higher level of truth, which is the Word of God that tells us that he sent his Word and healed our diseases. The faith of Jesus by which we walk comes from the Word of God. And in John chapter 1, we're told that Jesus is the Word made flesh. So in the last video, we were looking in Mark chapter 4, back at the parable of the sower. We ended with verse 26. He says, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should set, cast seed to the ground, should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring up and grow up. He knoweth not how, for the earth brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. The kingdom of God operates on the principle of seed, time, and harvest. In context of Mark chapter 4, the seed that Jesus was talking about was the Word of God. Now, I've, I've heard people use this passage to talk about planting financial seeds, planting healing seeds, planting all kinds of different seeds, but specifically in context, what Jesus was talking about was the Word of God. Now, within the Word, you will find passages on, on healing, and we can call those healing seeds. But what Jesus was talking about, when he talks about the, the types of ground, when he goes through this parable, he's talking about our receptiveness to the Word of God. It is our receptiveness to the Word of God that determines the level we are able to exercise the faith of the Son of God in our lives. We walk by the faith of the Son of God. We walk by the faith of the Son of God, not by sight not by the input of our five physical senses. And how does that faith work? Jesus said, it says, it says the kingdom of God is if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he doesn't know how. You do not need to know how this works. And that is one particular temptation that a lot of people fall into. They, need, they try to overanalyze this and try to figure out if we do these 12 steps, if we do this, these six steps, we'll get bigger faith. But if you're walking by the faith of the Son of God, and you're walking by the measure of faith that God has apportioned to you, and we all have that same measure of faith, then how can you cause the faith of the Son of God to grow or not to grow? We are called to walk by faith and not by sight, not by the five physical, the input of our five physical senses. And I know I keep saying that over and over, but this is something we need to get a hold of. Faith works by casting seed in the ground. The ground, we've said, is our soul. The soul is the ground, is the earth that Jesus is talking about here. When he talks about the stony ground, the thorns, earlier in this chapter, he's talking about four conditions of your soul. As you hear the word of God, the enemy comes to steal that word. The afflictions, the trials, the symptoms, the sicknesses, 
the things that come against us in this life are coming against us to steal the word that we have heard. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Your position of focus determines your level of revelation. If you are focused on the word of God, you will see a harvest of revelation knowledge coming from that word. It may not happen today, it may not happen tomorrow, but if you continuously are planting the word of God into your soul, allowing that word to wash over you, as Paul says in Ephesians, the washing of the water of the word, if you take that word and allow it to infiltrate your soul, it will begin to develop a picture within you. And we talked about the process of faith in the previous video. I started talking about that. And one thing I said, and, and I'll put a graphic up here on the screen for you, but what the Lord has shown me is this, there's a process. We have our spirit, which is the part of us that was recreated. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 tells us that we become new creations. All things are become new. All things in the spirit become new. In, in 1 John 4, 17, we see that as he is, so are we in this world. As Jesus is in the Spirit, we are identical to Him right now in this world. We are not becoming more holy. We're not becoming more righteous. We are identical to Jesus in the Spirit. But our soul, which is our mind, will, intellect, and emotions, and our body is not changed at salvation. If you are tall when you got saved, you will still be tall after you get saved. If you are overweight, you will still be overweight. If you have brown hair when you got saved, you will still have brown hair. Your body is not yet redeemed. There is coming a time. Jesus is going to be returning soon for his church. And when he returns, your body will be glorified. But until that point, we live in a physical body. We have a soul. And in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, we've seen it many times in these videos, that we are transformed by the renewing of our mind, by the washing of the water of the word. We are not allowing ourselves to be conformed to this world. We're not allowing ourselves to be pressed into the image of this world. But instead, we're taking the word on a day-by-day -day basis, just as he instructed Joshua to do in Joshua chapter 1, and verse 8, to meditate upon the word day and night. We take that word, we meditate on it, we let it wash over our soul. We let it transform us into the image of God. We are recreated into his image. We are made new creations in Christ Jesus. But as our soul begins to develop in the Word of God, we will start to see the life of God flow out. But there is a process, and this is the what I'm putting up on the screen for you now, is God's Word is the seed that comes down into your soul. We water that seed with prayer, and as we do that, as we're meditating on it, it starts feeding into our imagination. And if you notice here, in Mark 4.27, I mean, excuse me, verse 28, it says, For the earth brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. The Lord has shown me, and I relate the imagination to the blade. First, the imagination. You take the word, you allow that word to begin painting the picture of the promises of God in your imagination. You begin to see yourself walking in healing. You begin to see yourself walking in prosperity. You begin to see yourself able to pay your bills. You begin to see yourself succeeding. As you meditate upon the Word and allow the truth of the Word to take hold within your soul, it begins to paint that new picture within you, and you begin to see yourself in your imagination. Then, as you continue to do that, you continue to pray. You continue to water that seed. That imagination will give birth to vision. In the Old Testament, we read that without a vision, the people perish. People walk, Christians walk in this earth with no vision because they do not see themselves in their imagination. They're not able to frame their life in their imagination because they're not spending time in the Word of God. In verse 28, again, in Mark chapter 4, in verse 28, it says, First the blade, then the ear. I like to think of the vision as the ear. First the imagination, the blade. You start getting that fuzzy picture. You start getting in your imagination that picture of all that God, of you walking in the promises of God, of you walking in healing, of you walking without that disease. And that gives birth to a vision. Vision gives direction. Vision gives birth to hope. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, we see that faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hope is the generator of faith. If you cannot hope for something, 
you will not be able to appropriate it by faith. But you will not hope for anything that you do not have a vision for. And you will not have a vision for anything that you cannot see in your imagination yourself acquiring. For example, people talk about walking by the power, you know, seeing the manifestation of the, of the Holy Spirit. They talk about, we want to see miracles. We want to see this and that. It's far easier to go hide ourselves in a closet and pray that God would raise up people to go out and walk in the power than to take responsibility to get in the Word, to pray, and to spend time with the Holy Spirit until you begin to develop that picture of you laying hands on the sick of you casting out demons, of you cleansing the lepers, of you raising the dead. Because if you cannot see yourself doing that in your imagination, you will have no vision for yourself to do that, and you will have no hope, and then therefore you will not be able to release the faith of the Son of God in that area. It all begins in our imaginations with painting a picture. Because what happens is, you know, when we talked about walking by faith and not by sight, walking by the Word of God, and not by the input of our five physical senses. This works in the natural realm just the way it works in the, in the spiritual realm. We receive a doctor's report. The doctor talks about the symptoms. He talks about, you know, this is a terminal situation. The doctor talks about it. We have those symptoms we, in our body. We have the pain. We hurt. It develops a picture in our mind, in our imagination, of ourselves with that disease, of, with those symptoms. We start seeing ourselves as the sick and not the healed because we are looking at the doctor's report, because we are considering the symptoms in our physical body. We're, list, we're, doing, we're meditating on that. It develops imagination, the blade. That imagination gives birth to vision, the ear. That vision gives birth to hope. What are we hoping for in that case? We are hoping for the sickness the doctor has talked about. We're hoping to continue walking in that disease, in with that pain, because now that it has got to the point of hope, we can no longer appropriate the Word of God. But it is not hopeless for us, because the process works the same, whether it's for the kingdom of God or whether it's for the natural realm. So, if we have a picture in our soul of ourselves being the sick, we can change that picture. We can develop a different picture just in the same manner we developed the first picture. So we can change the picture, and that is the beauty of grace. One thing we saw, we looked at Thomas, the account of Thomas, in, a previous, in previous videos. Thomas heard the other disciples talk about Jesus appearing to them. Jesus breathed on them to receive you, the Holy Ghost. I believe at that moment they were born again. They received the Holy Spirit. They came back with great joy. The first person they, came, they talked to that they shared the account of what had happened to them was Thomas. He heard it. He had seen Jesus on the cross. He had seen Jesus give up the ghost. He had seen the soldiers take the spear and put it up and saw the blood and the water drain out of Jesus' body. He had seen them take the body of Jesus off the cross. He had seen them roll the stone and seal the grave. He had seen all these things, and he had a picture within his soul, within his imagination. He had framed his belief with the death of Jesus. It was not easy for him, therefore, to accept what the other disciples had said. They had a different picture because they had experienced the resurrected Jesus. He had not. If the tables were turned, we have to wonder, would Peter have reacted the same way as Thomas did? If he had not been there when Jesus appeared and breathed on them, would John have reacted that way? We'll never know. But because of what they have framed in their imagination, because of the picture that he had he was unable to receive the report of Jesus' resurrection, even though Jesus had prophesied multiple times that he would be dead for three days and then be raised again. He had prophesied to the disciples the fact that he was going to be crucified. He had told them these things were going to happen. He had prepared them, but they considered what they were seeing with their physical senses, what they were looking at as they watched Jesus on the cross. Thomas was considering what he had heard when Jesus gave up the ghost. He was considering 
the, re, the input of his five physical senses while he stood there watching as they nailed Jesus to the cross. He was not considering the prophecies of the word, the word that Jesus had given, that he would be crucified, but then he would be raised again. That's why Thomas was struggling. Thomas was struggling because he was not considering the things that Jesus had said. He was not considering the promise of God, but he was considering the input of his five physical senses from the experience he had had at the cross. Does that mean the cross, if he had been considering the word of God, if he had considered the promises of Jesus to be raised again, and he had responded completely differently, does that mean the crucifixion didn't happen? No. He was there. He saw it. He experienced it. Does that mean if you're considering the word of God of your symptoms, does that mean the symptoms do not exist? No. You are there. You have those symptoms in your body. But you are choosing to consider the truth of God's word over the facts of your symptoms. See, Thomas could have stood there at the cross saying to himself, he prepared us for this. He has told us this was going to happen. He is going to be resurrected in three days. Thomas could have been sitting there with an expectation to hear about the resurrection because Jesus had already told them in three days I will be raised up. But he did not consider the word of God. He considered the input of his five physical senses. But the interesting thing, and we'll take a quick look at it in John chapter 20, the interesting thing is Jesus' reaction to Thomas. You know, in Romans chapter 8, it tells us that we have no condemnation in Christ Jesus. God understands that we live in an unredeemed physical body. We may be recreated, we may be new creations in Christ Jesus, but we still have the limitations of our physical being. We still have the limitations of our five physical senses that have not yet been glorified. And I, I think it's a great illustration for each one of us to look at Jesus' response to Thomas. After In John chapter 20 and verse 26, it says, After eight days, again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy, th thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach thither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed, or more blessed, are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. The one thing that's interesting to me in looking at this, is we're talking about the process of faith. God understands that we have limitations. He understands that we have our five physical senses speaking things contrary to the word of God. Thomas refused to believe because he was considering the input of his five physical senses. He was considering the things he had experienced at the crucifixion. He had ex considering the things that he had, he had experienced as they nailed Jesus to the cross. He was considering the input of his five physical senses as he watched them with the whips tearing Jesus's body apart. He was considering that when the disciples came and said, Jesus had been resurrected. He was not considering the prophecies of Jesus. He was, cons in, in the context for ourselves, we would be considering our symptoms, not the word of God. Symptoms are very real. Symptoms are very real for Thomas. But as Paul said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. If you look at this story with Thomas, one thing that sticks out to me is you don't see any indication that Jesus got upset, that Jesus was frustrated with Thomas, that Jesus was angry at Thomas. Thomas chose not to believe, but Jesus was patient with him. He showed mercy. He showed him the, the scars in his hands. He showed them the wounds in his body. And because of that, Thomas chose to believe. But then Jesus said, there is a higher way. Many people today will not believe in the healing power of God until they see a manifestation of the miraculous power of God. God in his mercy pours out his miracles, his signs and wonders, his power, because he knows the limitations of our flesh. In, in Psalm chapter 78, he said that he remembers that we are just but flesh and blood. We are just a puff of vapor is what it says in Psalm 78. He recognizes the limitations of our humanity. He has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness, First, that, we, that Peter tells us, through the knowledge of him, through his word. But he also recognizes that we are in a fallen world, 
in the best place, the highest level of faith, the highest level of believing is to move with the word of God, to not require to see something to believe. That is the best. But you see here, Jesus showed mercy to Thomas. He did not get upset. He did not get frustrated. He understood where Thomas was, and he ministered to him at that point. And that's the one thing you'll find out with God. God will always meet us where we're at. There is always a higher level of belief. There's always a higher level of faith that we can walk in because we're walking in his faith, and we can grow in our ability to walk in that faith. When we talk about coming up to a higher level of faith, it's not that we're increasing in faith because it is the faith of the Son of God that we're walking in. It's that we're learning and developing in our ability to look away from the input of our five physical senses to look at the promises of God's Word. As I, as, as I said with Thomas, looking at the process of faith, he had heard, traveled with Jesus for over three years. He had seen the miracles. He had seen Lazarus come forth from the grave. He was there when the water was turned into wine. He experienced the miraculous traveling with Jesus. He heard Jesus prophesy that he would die and resurrect in three days. He had heard the word of God, so he had been exposed to proper teaching. In Matthew 10, we can see where Jesus sent the disciples out. They came back with reports of miraculous flowing through them. Thomas was one of those. He had experienced the miraculous. The lesson we can learn from that is you never come to the place where you can coast. We have to keep considering the word. We have to keep looking at the word. And that's why in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, God told Joshua, the key to success is meditate on the word day and night. I've said it previously, the word of God, we don't visit the word of God. We make it our dwelling, our abode, our biting place. I believe that's where Thomas found his shortfall. Because he walked in the miraculous, he had traveled with Jesus, he'd experienced the power of God. But then at the crucifixion, he reached his limit. Why? Because he was not keeping the promises of Jesus in mind when Jesus had prophesied that he would be, you know, that he would die. When he told them that he was leaving them, Jesus prepared them. But just as he prepared us with his word. Jesus gave us his word. He sent his word and healed all our diseases before that first symptom came up. Symptoms grow and increase in our body because when those symptoms come, we react just as Thomas and we look at the symptom and start considering the symptom and start of looking to the word and considering the promises of God. Well, our time is up today. If these videos are a blessing to you, I just ask you to subscribe, like, and share them with your friends. Share them with your friends. Let them know what God is speaking to you as you're listening, as you're watching these videos. Caroline, I love you. We are praying for you. And I just want you to remember, you can live your life to the fullest, walking by the faith of the Son of God.